Hello, welcome to our Wyoming State Library presentation of Virtual Field Trips in Wyoming. I'm Paige Bradenkamp of the Wyoming State Library in Cheyenne. Today's presenters are Nathan Doerr of the Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne and Megan Smith of the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody. They're here to share about the field trips they offer that are available to anyone, anywhere. These are great resources, and today Megan and Nathan will share about what they are and how to bring these field trips to your library or classroom. So I will turn this over to Megan, and we will get started. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting us today. My name is Megan Smith, as Paige said, from the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. I'm the K-12 Curriculum and Digital Learning Specialist there. And we run a pretty robust uh, virtual field trip program through Skype in the Classroom. If you haven't heard about it, Skype in the Classroom uh, is run by Microsoft in Education. They have a built-in network of an incredible number of teachers. And they offer resources through organizations throughout the world, not just uh, the Wyoming State Museum and the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Uh, and these organizations are they are kind of hand-picked by, by Microsoft in Education. So they really are some of... Um, the best resources that you can really find in the world. And they offer everything from virtual field trips, which is what Nathan and I are going to talk about today. Uh, but they also offer something called Mystery um, Skype, which I believe uh, Nathan does. They also are an opportunity for classes to connect with other classes within their state, region, country, or even the world. So it's an incredible resource. I encourage you to... Uh, check it out. We are going to, in a little bit, actually bring up the Microsoft in Education website and kind of show you a little bit about how to navigate it and how registration works. And really, it's a big site just to help you feel comfortable with it. But I'd like to start by just telling you a little bit about our program at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Um, as you know, in Cody and throughout Wyoming, we live in a rural state, so it's hard to reach students and being able to come to the center on field trips. So looking at that, five years ago, we decided to launch Skype in the Classroom. We became a partner with Skype in the Classroom before they were even part of Microsoft. And we offered a couple of virtual field trips. It was something that we thought, this might be a really interesting way to connect with kids throughout the world, but also all of our Wyoming schools, where it's hard, especially in the winter, to be able to travel and visit these great cultural institutions in our state. Uh, so we launched that um, with a mountain man Skype lesson, and then very slowly we started adding new lessons, and the response has been incredible. So to date, since May 2013, we've Skyped with about 85,000 students in over 50 countries in all 50 states. Uh, and today, we really want to kind of plug this to Wyoming, because while the offerings that... Um, we provide, they all meet national standards, but they also all meet Wyoming standards in social studies, in science, in culture, and in art. Uh, we get a lot of requests from different Wyoming schools who are looking for something really particular, and we're happy to, we're happy to fine-tune what it is that we offer uh, to schools and to students, so it really makes for the best experience for students, but really also adds and supplements to what you're doing in the classroom. And as we kind of keep going today, a little bit later we'll introduce all of those virtual experiences that between Nathan and I that we offer. We, we don't want to dig too deep into that quite yet because we want to tell you a little bit just about the program itself. What I'd like to do is actually show you a video uh, about our Skype program. It's kind of a brief overview and it gives you an idea of the experiential nature of the Skype lesson. It is not about educators standing up here and just talking at the kids. We want the kids chatting and sharing with us. We want them to build on their own content skills and inquiry-based. We're really inquiry-based. We want students to be at the center of their learning. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. Of course, I've got to just remember how to do that. Sorry about that little pause there, but let me go ahead and play this Bye. video Bye. for you. When we first started Skype in the classroom, the idea was not to create something new. It was to take things that were already successful on site 
and deliver them in a virtual way? We have a lot of artifacts and we have facsimiles that we use in Skype and classes. It sort of brings to life the subject matter for a teacher in a class. All our lessons are lined up with standards and so it's if the teacher's looking for supplemental material to meet standards, we have it. Being able to connect with students at whatever age and with their teachers. Not just share the web, but share experiences and learn from each other is just so incredibly rewarding. And to be able to talk to them, you know, they're sharing with us, we're sharing with them. It's this dialogue that happens. For me as an educator, that's what it's about. So, um, as you can see, we have a lot of fun with our Skype lessons. Uh, for me, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done professionally is to provide these lessons for students. We have about four or five educators that also provide the lessons. One thing I do want to mention that I forgot to mention earlier is that all of our experiences are K-12. We have a couple that are just high school or upper elementary, but most of them are for the K-12 audience. And we um, have written those so that we can kind of go up grade levels and go down grade levels so that we can provide the appropriate content. Um, it's something we're really used to doing. So no matter what grade you might be teaching or you might be setting up a Skype lesson for, remember that. We can really fine tune what those experiences are for your students. So in a nutshell, that's what we offer here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. I'm going to hand it over to Nathan now, who's going to talk a little bit about what um, the Wyoming State History Museum uh, offers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Megan. And again, thank you, Paige, for inviting us today. Uh, as, as Megan mentioned, these programs are so incredibly rewarding. They're so exciting, and they've easily become some of my favorite programs as well, which is funny because uh, prior to, to using Skype in the classroom for, for programming, Skype was not my favorite thing to do. Technology terrified me. But uh, through the mentoring of, of Megan and the other staff up, of, up at Buffalo Bill Center of the West, uh, we jumped into virtual field trips and Skype in the classroom back in the, let's say, the fall of 2014. And uh, we offered our programs that fall. And I think we gave about six programs to a handful of students. And I was instantly hooked. Since that time, we have uh, provided virtual field trip programming to uh, almost 20,000 students, about 435 instruction hours. We've completed uh, over 3 million virtual round trip miles, uh, which is very exciting. And I've provided programming to students in 48 states here in the U.S., one U.S. territory, and 33 foreign countries. But what I'm really most excited about today, it's a really exciting day, is that uh, this is, I'm counting it, as my 700th virtual field trip. Uh, so those are 700 really amazing, and each one being an incredibly unique experience that we've just had so much fun with here at the Wyoming State Museum. Uh, a little bit of background on how we started out doing our virtual field trips. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, equipment a little bit later, but I started out by using an iPad on an iPad selfie stick walking around our museum relying on the Wi-Fi. And I did that for uh, about three and a half years. And uh, it, was, it was great, it was a fun experience, but uh, I was constantly getting in visitors' ways and, and it made it difficult to talk about certain things when there were visit visitors uh, standing in a certain area of an exhibit that we were ready to talk about. So thanks to a, a large grant that we received just about a year ago now, uh, I now have this, this converted uh, storage room has been converted into our virtual field trip studio. So that demonstrates a little bit of just how uh, confident we are and proud we are of our virtual field trips. Um, a few other things before I jump into giving some examples of virtual field trips. Uh, we jumped in uh, with the intent of reaching more students across the state of Wyoming and our rural schools. And uh, it didn't take long before I realized that 
that we were having a lot of other schools, a lot of other programs throughout the entire world who were engaging in these programs. And it took us about three years before we had our first Wyoming students participate in a virtual field trip with the Wyoming State Museum. And we discovered, and I know the uh, staff at Buffalo Bill Center of the West has discovered this issue as well, that a lot of that is due to Skype as a platform being blocked in a lot of school districts across the state of Wyoming. So today uh, we're using GoToWebinar, uh, and I know between Megan and I, we've used a lot of different video platforms. So I want to stress that, and we'll continue stressing that uh, throughout the session today, just the importance of, of we're more than happy to adapt and use whatever platforms teachers and librarians are able to use, not just in Wyoming, but, but uh, everywhere as well, so that we can really reach out to those students. So what I want to do is I want to give you some examples of some of the programming that we do through virtual field trips here at the Wyoming State Museum. And then uh, I know Megan is going to give you some experiences as well. Uh, we'll talk about all of our uh, programs when we jump to the website, but uh, a mystery Skype is definitely our most popular program. You can mystery Skype most commonly between classrooms where both classrooms are asking each other where the other classroom is by asking yes, no questions as they try and use clues and the answers to, to find where the other students are. Uh, we do it a little bit differently. Uh, students will ask me yes or no questions using my answers, clues of, of things I say, uh, things on my desk, things on the shelves behind me. Those students will pretty quickly figure out where I am. And then once they do that, we will explore Wyoming. We talk about Wyoming's landscape. We talk about uh, some of our wildlife. We talk about one of our cultures, the Plains Indians. And then I turn it over to the students. Um, I have done mystery Skypes with uh, classrooms here in Wyoming. Um, and we, we have a lot of fun with that because they, they don't expect uh, that I'm in their own state. But what I want to do, I'm going to share my screen now. When I uh, share my screen, since I'm in a static studio most of the time, uh, I rely on photographs and, and uh, pictures of artifacts and pictures of areas throughout the state. So we, we touch base and, and explore where Wyoming is. We look at the ge geographical size of Wyoming. We talk a little bit about that. We can look at uh, the state of Wyoming itself and talk about some important places. Uh, we just take a, a quick image of, of that before we start exploring um, that I'm here at the Wyoming State Museum. And I'm just going to go through a few of these slides pretty quickly just to give you an idea of uh, what all we do during our, our virtual field trips. But we can explore different exhibits here at the Wyoming State Museum. We can talk, as I mentioned, about the landscape and the wildlife and uh, the bison is an animal that, that I like to talk a lot about uh, throughout all of our programs. And uh, one thing I really like to integrate when I'm talking about the bison, and I really wanted to bring this up today uh, with knowing that we have a, an audience of, of lots of librarians, is literacy, of course. So I like to tell a legend about uh, the, the Plains Indian and the bison. So I want to tell you that legend really quickly now. So it's a legend based, or a, a book that I read based on the, uh, the book by Paul Goebel called The Great Race of the Birds and Animals. So uh, The Great Race of Birds and Animals by Paul Goebel. Uh, I've read this story so many times that, that uh, I can tell it by memory pretty close anyway. So we talk about this legend and how long ago the, the Plains Indians believed that the bison used to eat people instead of the other way around. And uh, how the people, the Plains Indians, didn't think that was fair. So it was decided that they were going to have this race. And, and they divided into two teams. The four-legged, the bison and all the other animals with four legs, race against the two-legged, the Plains Indians and the birds. And they race around the, the Black Hills on the eastern side of Wyoming. Uh, and this race takes several days. But whichever team wins the race gets a chance to hunt and eat the other team. Well, at the very beginning of the race, uh, we have this bird called Magpie. And Magpie decides that she is going to win the race. So Magpie flies down. She lands on Bison's back, and she stays there the entire race. All along the race, different animals, they go in the wrong direction. They get tired. They give up. They find new homes. Or they get eaten by other animals. At the very end of the race, though, it's down to three runners, Plains Indian, Bison, and Magpie. Plains Indian and Bison are both exhausted. They both run their fastest, and nobody could tell them that they should have run any faster. 
but everybody has forgotten about Magpie. Magpie is still on Bison's back. She's not tired at all. So as soon as she sees the finishing line, she flies off of Bison's back and swoops across that finishing line just in front of Bison. So the two-leggeds have won the race. And now the two-leggeds, the Plains Indians, are able to hunt and eat the four-leggeds, the Bison, instead of the other way around. So we can talk now about different uh, teaching collection objects that we have. So we talk about the bison beer, and we can talk about how the Plains Indians believe that this is a symbol of that legend, believing that the hair of the bison is the hair of the people that the bison used to eat. Uh, we can talk about how this is a reminder of that legend and, and how seeing this can remind us of different lessons uh, that were learned. So one lesson is to, to give thanks and to honor the birds for taking the two-legged side in the great race. So one way we can thank and honor the birds, uh, the Plains Indians will wear a headdress. Now, this is a very special and a very sacred artifact, and each of the individual feathers in this can represent some of the very good deeds, the brave and heroic things that an individual has done in order, in this case, to become chief of the tribe. And we know one reason that uh, a headdress like this is worn is to thank and honor the birds. Another really amazing lesson is to be resourceful. Of course, we know to be resourceful means we use resources wisely and we don't waste anything. So we can talk about the Plains Indian and the bison and how hunting the bison is kind of like, well, it's kind of like how today when we have a shopping list, there are things we, we need, food and clothing, things we want, like treats and toys. Uh, we could go to a store like Walmart, but long ago, Plains Indians, couldn't go to Walmart, but I like to think uh, by hunting a bison, it was kind of like going to, to Bison Mart, and they could acquire many of the things they needed and wanted by being resourceful. So we can talk about different bison parts, uh, like the bison's bladder here, uh, which was used as a ball to play games, used as a pouch, but most importantly, used as a water bottle. So this just gives us a chance to really explore some, some teaching collection artifacts as we explore different parts of the museum, and uh, we have a lot of fun. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Megan uh, to give a little example of part of their program programming all right, so where I started um, our webinar was kind of at our home base where we start all of our lessons. Our most popular lesson is amazing animal adaptations. And we begin the lesson, lesson talking about the essentials of what animals need to survive. We introduce the word adaptations, and then depending on the grade level, we'll talk about uh, structural and behavioral adaptations using those vocabulary terms if the grade level is appropriate. We will then do a screen share very similar to what Nathan did, introducing students to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We have a great video that we use. We show some clips of the geothermal features, and we talk a bit about the supervolcano to give students kind of the breadth and scope of Yellowstone, because as you know, it's so amazing. Uh, and we do that with any of the students, including Wyoming students, because not everybody has had a chance to get up to Yellowstone. From there, we actually will head into our Draper Natural History Museum here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and we will visit the four habitats that make up the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So we kind of, uh, we make it like an expedition. They start at the tippy tip of the top of the mountain in the alpine habitat. They make their way down to the mountain forest then down into the riparian zone, or the mountain meadow, and then the plains basin where we here are here in Cody. And as we talk about each of these habitats, we're introducing animals and the unique adaptations they have for surviving in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So while we're talking, I am actually going to visit our mountain forest. So we would have just come down from the alpine habitat, a harsh place to live, can be wintertime any time of the year, such a harsh place that trees can't even grow there. And that makes a really great transition down into our mountain forest. Uh, and I'm gonna, as I'm talking, kind of imagine that you're third through fifth graders um, as I'm talking to you. We get down into the mountain forest and we have trees. We have deciduous trees whose leaves turn colors, fall to the ground, 
we grow in the spring. We have coniferous trees, one of my favorite words, trees with cones and needles. And here in this habitat, we have our wolf, an animal that lives in a pack, our very top predator. Here is our gray wolf. Now, this is our alpha wolf that lives in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. This is the male, the leader of the pack. Here's a pup. And here's another pup. And here's the alpha female. So every pack has two leaders, a male and a female leader, the alphas. Now, this pack is a small pack. It's only about four wolves. Most wolf packs are between 12, 15 wolves. The largest pack that has been known in Yellowstone is about 30 wolves. So that was, that's a pretty wolf, big wolf pack. At some point, they would break apart and form two new packs. Now, boys and girls, I want you to think about being a wolf, living in a pack. It's a behavioral adaptation. It's something wolves do to help them survive. And this is where I'd have kids brainstorm a little bit, talk with me about why living in a pack is an important adaptation. And ultimately what we get to with that is we talk about hunting and how hunting as a pack really helps them to hunt those bigger animals that live in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, like the bison and the moose and the elk, animals like that. And then from there, we compare some skulls. So students can start to get an idea of just how big a wolf is. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little fox skull. Okay. Now you all know what a coyote looks like. Let's see if the coyote skull is bigger. And you know what it is. It's a little bigger. And now we're going to look at the wolf skull. Who thinks the wolf skull is going to be bigger and how much bigger? Let's find out. And there it is. And usually this gets kind of an ooh and an ah and a gasp from the students because the wolf is so much bigger. And my, look at those big sharp teeth the wolf has. Now, wolves are carnivores, they're meat eaters, and their teeth are built for eating meat. So as I would transition now and go to another habitat and walk down to the riparian zone, and while we're going, we're talking. We're talking about wolves. We're talking about our own dogs and how they communicate by barking and growling and wagging their tail and pinning their ears back. The idea that we're getting at here is that communication is an adaptation. It's an important way um, for animals to survive, especially when they live in groups. And at this point, we usually have the kids howl um, like wolves, because who doesn't like howling like wolves? And really quickly, I'm just going to do a little point comparison down here in the riparian zone, so we're where the land meets the water. And this habitat is so diverse. It has so many different kinds of plants and animals. Now, the students up in the alpine habitat would have already been introduced to this animal, the grizzly bear. But what I want to talk about with the grizzly bear is something similar that we did with the wolves, and that's teeth. So teeth are such an important adaptation. Think about the teeth we have in our mouths and what they help us to eat. Most of us are omnivores. We eat both plants and meat. And so are grizzly bears. So they need teeth for doing just that. So let's zoom in on a grizzly bear skull. All right, so let's look at these teeth. They're kind of flat. So if you think about it, those are gonna be the teeth for eating plants. And these are the teeth for eating meat. So that kind of gives you just a, an example of how we share both the structural and behavioral adaptations of animals. We finish up in the Plains Basin. Uh, we always leave time for questions with students. And something that we do with this lesson is we have a pre-activity where we ask students to research animals that live in their own area, draw that animal in its habitat, and at the end of the lesson they have time to share out their pictures and their animals. Obviously for kids in Wyoming we're going to have a lot of similarities there, which is a great way to reinforce where they live, make it relevant, and make it a part of um, kind of their sense of place and where they live. So that's just a little nutshell of our amazing animal adaptations lesson. 
I'll tell you about some of our other lessons um, in a little bit after Nathan shares a little bit more about his lessons and dives in a little bit to our Microsoft and Education website. So I am going to switch it back over to Nathan. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Always fun to see uh, the exciting things that you do. And, and that's one of my, my favorite places to explore in Wyoming. So, all right. So now hopefully you can see my screen. And I want to show you a little bit about uh, the Skype in the Classroom Microsoft Educator Community website. So these are going to be links that uh, we'll share at the very end, but you can simply uh, search the internet using uh, whatever uh, search tool you like uh, for Skype in the classroom. And you'll eventually find pretty quickly at the top of the list a, uh, a link for the Microsoft Educator Community and Skype in the classroom. When you go to this website, you will be able to begin exploring a variety of ways to really and truly connect your classroom to the world. Now, one thing I would encourage you to do from the very beginning is to go ahead and join as an educator. It's a simple process for you to set up a profile and that allows you to start exploring and to start registering for sessions. So you can see these are five different ways that you'll be able to connect and each uh, of these ways has a variety of programs virtual field trips, Skype lessons, Skype collaborations, mystery Skype, and guest speakers. We're going to go ahead and go into virtual field trips here, and you will see a list of those starting to show up. And they've grouped them into categories, animals, ecology and conservation, history and culture, and other subjects. So let's just, well, I happen to see our first one right here depicting the West, Forts on the Frontier. This is the very first program that we started offering. When we uh, joined uh, as a, a partner, it was with the Wyoming Art Museum Consortium, and our, all of our lessons, we wanted them to have some sort of an art focus. So the pre-lesson with this activity is we asked teachers to have students spend a little bit of time drawing uh, whatever comes to mind uh, when they think of a fort on the frontier. And then when we start off that lesson, after a short introduction, the students will share their, some of the students will share their drawings with me. And then I will start showing some illustrations and photographs of forts in Wyoming. And we have a conversation and talk about why we had forts, what those forts did, who the, who the people were at those forts, and what those individuals did, and really what the impact of those forts was on the West. So as you look at this lesson, you can see learning objectives. You can see a description of the session. You can see uh, approximate length of time. You can find student ages. And, and I will mention that um, even though I have it listed for 8 to 10, uh, 11 to 13, and 14 to 18, uh, some of our programs I've, I've limited. But I am always so happy to customize our lessons to fit a particular age range and uh, uh, to, to fit a particular focus as well. So we'll see here in a minute how you can, how an educator can let me know if they have a certain interest that they're looking at. You can see the category, languages, um, you can see people who have been interested. Uh, they list uh, the ISTE standards. Uh, you can see some images, other examples. If you uh, want to learn a little bit more about the partner who is presenting, you can learn about them here. And then um, there are just some other useful tools that uh, the Microsoft Educator community provides there. But what I want to do is come up here and click to register for the lesson so that you can see just how easy this process is. So we all keep our availability up to date as best we can. And when you go in here and say we're looking uh, at the 12th, you'll see my available times. And you can only do this once you've created that profile. But you go in, click the time that you're looking at, this is a great spot. I really encourage educators to use this message feature to let us know uh, grade levels, how many students, if you have a particular focus that you're looking for. Uh, I have teachers a lot of times say uh, that they're exploring the, um, uh, westward migration and, and uh, manifest destiny and other, other things. And this is a place for you to really let me know what you're looking for. And then all you have to do is request this session and within minutes, uh, in seconds, really, I will get an email letting me know that you have submitted a request, and I try and process those 
uh, as soon as I possibly can. And in addition to following up via this website, I do send an email directly to you and uh, we, we go from there to, to confirm everything and then we do connect. So I wanted to explore our, uh, some of our other content, uh, depicting on the West I mentioned was our first. Mystery Skype is, as I mentioned earlier, our most popular program. Wyoming in the West is really my, my fourth grade curriculum here at the Wyoming State Museum that I present to on-site students when they come for field trips, but I've made it into a, a, a virtual uh, session so we can explore different facets of Wyoming's history. We focus on Plains Indians, Mountain Men, Frontier Army, uh, ranching, and natural resources. We also offer behind the scenes working at the Wyoming State Museum. And this just looks a little bit about what, what work goes into exhibits uh, and, and museums and gets kids thinking about um, a potential career. And then greetings from Wyoming is essentially our mystery Skype without the mystery portion. It's just the exploration of Wyoming as we look at landscape, animals, and uh, Plains Indians. So I wanted to show you really quickly uh, a video that I received from a teacher uh, in Texas after following a mystery Skype. This just is, is fun and it gives you a little bit of an idea and hopefully everything cooperates.
like showing that for just a few reasons. I, I really like uh, some of what you see in the classroom, happening in the classroom with the Mystery Skype, students working together, trying to figure out where I am. And the other thing I really like about that little video is at one point or a few points in there, you can see the students gathered around an iPad watching me. And uh, I like using that because it, it shows us that there are technical issues. Dealing with technology like this, things are going to happen. Sometimes the volume might not work. Sometimes the video might not come through. Sometimes the smart board in the classroom might not work. So we work together. We um, do what we can to keep that session going. And if we have to, uh, we're going to reschedule. But uh, um, between Megan and myself, we have done it, and all the crew at Buffalo Bill Center of the West, we've done a lot of Skypes and other virtual field trips on a variety of platforms. And uh, we have some pretty quick troubleshooting experience as well. So uh, that's kind of a nutshell of what we do here at the Wyoming State Museum with virtual field trips. And I want to turn it over to Megan now so she can tell you a little bit more about what all they do at Buffalo Bill Center of the West. All right. Thank you, Nathan. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull up the content that we have uh, for the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And I just want to stress a couple things that Nathan said that um, they really struck me how important um, those topics that he said. And that is the technology. Don't let the technology frighten you. Um, we are used to troubleshooting and helping any way we can. We're used to switching platforms really quickly. Um, and we understand when technology doesn't work. You know, nine times out of ten, it works beautifully. Sometimes it doesn't. We work with you, and like Nathan said, we also reschedule. So I do want to show you just a little bit. Um, okay, so here we are back at um, kind of our launch page for Microsoft in Education. We do about 30 to 40 lessons per week. Um, so we're booked out pretty far. We're typically booked out about a month. In January, we're hoping to hire some more educators to help us so that we don't have quite that backup. But that tool, our scheduler, keeps this scheduling calendar, she updates it almost every day. Um, so that is kind of, you know, real time there, what you're looking at. And she, like Nathan, will, will email back and forth with you to make sure that you're setting up the best experience possible for your class. So a little bit about some of our lessons. The very first lesson that we launched was our Trappers, Traders, Trailblazers, Mountain Men of the Rocky Mountain West. This works great for fourth grade um, social study standards when uh, talking about Wyoming. So just like Nathan said, we have our learning objectives, we have our description. Um, we even have a place where we'd love to hear how we did our Skype classroom lessons evaluation. And then we also have resources that tell you a little bit more about this lesson. So we have a video that describes this lesson to give uh, teachers an idea of what their students will be experiencing. We have something called a Sway presentation, um, which is this wonderful Microsoft tool that's a little more dynamic than what PowerPoint can offer. And it kind of goes into some of the details of the mountain men. Um, so it's great supplemental information that uh, will work you know, before or after your lesson about the life of the mountain man, the art of the mountain man, and so on. Uh, we have created teacher guides for all of our lessons with uh, lesson objectives, pre-lesson activities, vocabulary, um, post-lesson activities, and different resources. Uh, we also have for this lesson a uh, curriculum guide that we have for our outreach chunk, which fits really well as well with this guide classroom. For, so teachers in Wyoming, you know, we could even set something up where we ship that trunk to you, you use that trunk, you know, before, during, or after the lesson to really make those objects kind of come alive. Um, we have image galleries. We try and have as many different uh, resources as we can. Um, our second most popular lesson is the story and cultures of Plains Indians in the Buffalo. And Nathan, it's funny that you mentioned it. We use literacy and we use a Paul Gumbel story as well. We use the story of Iktomi and the Buffalo Skull. So Iktomi and the Buffalo Skull. Um, it's a great story. It kind of has a moral behind it because Iktomi is always getting himself in trouble. But it introduces culture really well to students and getting at the idea how cultures 
can be different from each other. So some of the resources that we offer for that, again, we have a video. Uh, we have another Sway presentation to give a little more background um, about how Plains Indians have used the buffalo with some leading questions for teachers to use to help facilitate using the Sway in their classroom. And again, we have a teacher guide. We have an activity, how to make a Plains Indian teepee or a Plains Indian parflesh. We also have um, uh, some resources and some scholarship that we're doing here at the museum that we want to share out because we think it'll be really helpful. This is our Plains Indian map um, where students can actually view how um, land has changed for Plains Indians going from, you know, zero boundaries to very tight boundaries on the reservation system. And then we also have these modules that teach about how Plains Indian culture in relation to village life, buffalo, uh, ceremonial aspects, and then even um, kind of reserv reservation life and how they came against that adversity and really are starting to renew their culture. So again, we try and provide as many resources as we can. So that's our mountain man and our stories and cultures of Plains Indians and the buffalo. This is our amazing animal adaptations lesson, which I already shared with you about. Um, do you see me like I see me, cultural perspectives in, Amer in Western American art? Um, this is a really fun lesson. This lesson is geared towards middle school and high school, although we've had some really sharp upper elementary school kids that we've taught this lesson to. And this one dives into the idea of how Plains Indians have been depicted both by European or Euro-American artists and then how they depict themselves. So it's, you know, one culture interpreting another culture and then a culture interpreting itself. And we use both historic and contemporary art for that lesson. A pre-lesson activity for that one is we ask students to draw a self-portrait of themselves and then appear to draw a portrait of them so that they're getting at how what they drew of themselves is probably kind of more, um, this more inner reflection towards it, whereas a friend's uh, portrait of them is going to be probably more on the outside, getting at that idea of perspective again. And then finally, we just launched a professional development opportunity uh, called What's the Story? Teaching with Objects in Your Classroom to Facilitate Student-Centered Learning. You know, one of the toughest things that um, we find teachers have, even when they come to the museum, is when they lead students around looking at objects, it's hard to know how to teach those objects if you don't know what the story is behind them. So this professional development opportunity is giving teachers a chance and the tools to be able to do that both at museum visits, but really within their own classroom. So almost taking primary resources to a whole new level in teaching with objects. So that is one that we can schedule any time for teachers. And uh, this one happens to be very focused on Plains Indians. One of the reasons we did that is because with Wyoming's um, new uh, legislation to have Wyoming Indian education for all, we're really wanting to ramp up those opportunities for Wyoming teachers. So we think this would really help teachers in their classroom, uh, and it is um, aligned to standards that will help you meet those new Indian Education for All benchmarks. And the same is true for stories and cultures of the Plains Indian. We're getting ready to launch another lesson in uh, early 2019 about how artists have depicted horses in art. You know, as funding is cut for art in schools, we want to be able to help teachers bring it to the classroom uh, in a unique way that's not just art, but it's talking about history. It's very multidisciplinary. So again, in a nutshell, that is what we offer. As you can tell from Nathan and I, we really do have um, so much fun teaching these lessons. Uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much fun it is. Uh, we're quite lucky to be able to do this. So um, that's all I have. Nathan, do you have anything you want to add, or are there any questions from any of the attendees? I don't. I think uh, we covered it pretty well. It's. I, I think I would just reiterate: uh, don't be scared of the technology. Um, it, it's everything can be tackled in one way or another, 
and uh, just start to explore it and have fun with it because we do have so much fun uh, doing these and, and other sessions. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's just what I would end with. I want to go on a virtual field trip now. That's a great resource. So thank you for, for sharing today. Yeah, thank you. It's a privilege. The funny thing is that we've actually had teachers who have Skyped with us come um, knock on our education um, suite door and said, hey, we Skyped with you and you helped us decide where we were going on vacation this year. So we're even impacting teachers. <laughs> yep. Thank you for joining us, everybody. This has been a Wyoming State Library presentation. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks.